Welcome to Perspectives on Neurodiversity, a podcast dedicated to challenging myths and assumptions about neurodiverse life. I am your host, Christopher Scott Wyatt, speaking as the autistic me. Joining us on this episode is Sarah Stelmach Brown. She's the host of the Caregiver Chronicles, a podcast that gives her personal and professional journey as a caregiver. Sarah was a certified nursing assistant for 17 years. She is also the mother of two boys on the autism spectrum. Welcome to the podcast, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You have two boys on the autism spectrum. My oldest son is 12 and my youngest son is eight. When did you and your husband find out that your boys were on the autism spectrum? So my youngest son was diagnosed at two. Um, he, or just at, just before his second birthday, we were pursuing the process of a diagnosis for him. He was very delayed with all of his milestones as, you know, a baby and a toddler. Around a year, he still wasn't quite crawling. He wasn't really verbal. He was making sounds, but not words. Uh, about 15 months, he started tiptoe walking. We had a doctor's appointment at that time. We took him to the doctor and the doctor was like, I think we need to pursue, you know, an evaluation and, and at the very least you birth the three for him. So we got my youngest son in birth to three, and this was back in 2017, 2018. We got him in birth to three. They came in our house. They put a paper in front of us, the seven signs of autism in a child under five. And six of the seven things described him. While we were going through the process of the hearing exam and the evaluations and all those things and um, the sleepless nights that you get as a parent of any child, but especially being told your child isn't, and I use air quotes because I don't believe in this word really, but being told your child isn't normal. I was doing research on autism and there were a lot of things that I was finding that was like, this is my, you know, my younger son doesn't do this, but my older son does. Um, inversion to textures and foods aversion to certain feelings, uh, meltdowns, my older son, and it, over like the littlest change in routine where my younger son seemed to be more okay with it and my older son just couldn't handle it. So we then pursued a, an evaluation for him and it was second grade just before he turned eight that my older son was diagnosed. So they were both diagnosed just before the COVID pandemic? Yes. You were... A certified nursing assistant, and then the pandemic hit. Yes. How did this lead to the Caregiver Chronicles podcast? Honestly, I was getting burnt out prior, caring for my kids as as any mom would, working, you know, full time. My husband working full time, but then the pandemic hit and it got harder. I didn't have school as a break for my kids anymore. I didn't have the option to send them to school. I had to do all their homeschool stuff and their therapies with them at home. I had to work in an environment and it's by no fault of my employer. And I want to make that clear. You know, the pandemic hit long-term care facility is very hard. That's that's no secret. And it's, that's no fault of my employers. It's no fault of any of the staff or the residents. But I had to work in an environment where my residents were suddenly isolated. Everything changed and it was hard and I couldn't eat. Like eating, there was no time to cook. We were ordering Domino's every day. I was exhausted. I was also on the back end helping my mom care for my grandmother as far as like coaching her and giving her advice. So I was watching my kids decline because I'm not a teacher or a therapist or an expert on anything. I was watching some of my residents struggle and decline because of isolation. And I was watching my grandmother decline from a distance and my mental health just tanked. And I told my husband one day, I just couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't see a light at the end of the tunnel. I couldn't see anything getting better. And I told my husband I wanted to die. And I meant it. And I was wise enough to reach out for help in that moment and go outside and reach out to a text crisis line. And I reached out to 988 and I spoke to somebody and it's so important. And I recommend just, you know, if you're feeling that way, if you're feeling hopeless and caregiving, reach out for help, please. And don't be ashamed of it. After I had gotten the help and kind of started to feel better and gotten support and got back into counseling and all those things I needed to do for myself, 
I was able to then tell my husband, you know, I think it's important that we share this story, that we reach out to family caregivers who are struggling because I know I wasn't the only one going through it. I know I wasn't. And I had different and unique perspectives on caregiving from different avenues. And kind of that's kind of how Caregiver Chronicles was started from probably one of my darkest days. It really turned into a light for me. During the pandemic lockdowns, those of us with children with special needs, challenges, differences, whatever you want to, whatever you're comfortable calling these situations, we had to manage our children 24-7 instead of getting any break at all. And that does take an emotional toll, not just on us individually, but on our relationships with our spouses, on our relationships with our children because we're exhausted. So how did you deal with that exhaustion when you couldn't get away? One of the things that I learned through counseling and through Caregiver Chronicles and just just through everything was how to fit self-care in in little tiny pockets of my day. And I also learned that self-care is is a term it's it's a term that's stigmatized and we need to get rid of the stigma for it. Self-care does not have to be expensive. It does not have to involve shopping sprees and nail salons. It does not have to be time consuming. It doesn't mean you're sitting and meditating for hours. It can be 10 minutes of putting your favorite song on and dancing in your kitchen. It can be watching a movie as a family and just sitting down and ordering pizza and having a lazy day or going for a walk, just going for a walk with your kids or something like that or the person you care for. Anyone can find these little pockets and moments for self-care. It's really hard to when you're so down in the dumps. But if you can find a way to get three minutes to play your favorite song or incorporate a dance party, start a dance party with your kids if you like music, anything. And you have a similar situation to ours. You have the 12-year-old and you said the 8-year-old? Yes. They are very different. They are both on the autism spectrum, but they are very different people. Oh, absolutely. Can you explain those differences? My 12-year-old son is very intelligent. His report card that just came out a couple weeks ago, his lowest grade was a 95. He is one of the smartest kids you'll ever meet. He's a a highly intelligent kiddo. He loves guitar. He loves music. He loves chess. He just beat a teacher in a game of chess blindfolded. That's my 12-year-old. Making friends, not so much for him. Not, not a thing for him. Um, he's working on it. We're working on that. Social and emotional control is is his big struggle. My eight-year-old is is a sweetheart also, but he's nonverbal. He's still in diapers. He requires 24-7 constant attention unless he's asleep and zipped in his bed. If I go to the bathroom with him, he'll maybe dump out the freezer if I don't lock it. If I leave a door unlocked, he will take off. Uh, so he, it's just where my 12 year old, I can leave him home alone for like an hour while I take my eight year old to therapy. You know, there's, so there's just a big difference in their abilities and things like that. And so that kind of gives me a little bit of a struggle with juggling, but we do try to do our best to find activities we all enjoy. This is something that people unfamiliar with the autism spectrum don't always understand. They'll ask, how can you as a college instructor, be autistic? How can your two daughters be autistic when they're so different? The autism spectrum, we also, our oldest is twice exceptional. She's gifted. She's going to go to a college prep middle school. She's precocious in her own way, but friendships are difficult for her. And that's why we have her in Girl Scouts. That's why we put her in School of Rock. So she's participating in music with other children. And our youngest has I think the nice way to say it is hygiene issues. Even though she's going to go into the fourth grade, she doesn't always use the bathroom correctly. We're still working on some very basic cleanliness. And she will break into the pantry. She will go out a door or a gate. And so the autism label, people will say, oh, well, we can, your youngest, yeah, we can see how she's a little different and has some needs. But your, your oldest is just you know, intelligent and quirky. She just doesn't get along with people. No, she's autistic. And it gets exhausting, not just caring for them, but sometimes defending them, explaining them, 
advocating for them as different people. They're not the same type of autism, just like my autistic traits aren't theirs or my ADHD or whatever we're talking about. How much of your energy was being spent advocating for two different types of autism? A lot. <laughs> um, most of it. It's interesting that you know we talk about this because that, that was my first thought with my older son was that he's just so smart and advanced in everything that, you know, he's just that smart, socially awkward kid that on I and I hate saying this because I hate generalizing people, but usually they're on that's the person on the spectrum. We've been camping with groups of people that we go camping with. And my my dad, they I've been asked this question exactly. How do they both have the same diagnosis when their needs are so different? And like you said, autism is a spectrum. It is a spectrum disorder, and you're very intelligent. My son's very intelligent. You are still going to be two very different autistic people as far as how autism affects you as individuals and just as people in general. Like, I have certain things that I like that I'm interested in, but it doesn't mean that the thing or like cooking would be a great example. Not every cook is a great baker. Not every cook wants to make a salad, but some love making salads or some cooks love to bake cookies. You know, it's just, it's it's a spectrum, just like everything else in life. And you said you had to explain to your, your family what the autism differences were. And I think that's something that many of us go through because even within our families, there can be a stigma. And then that's also exhausting, trying to explain even to family members what our children are. How did you approach that? Honestly, and and sometimes, on, on, fortunately for me, I have a very supportive family. When the diagnosis first came with my younger son, there was a little bit of a pushback from my family. Like, how can that be? They're so smart, and you know, and and there had to be a uh, some education, but not just on my behalf. I'm fortunate. My younger sister is a special education teacher and has her background in early special education. So when I would say like, no, just intelligence doesn't mean not autistic. It's it's intelligence and autism really aren't necessarily the same thing. There's not exactly a correlation between the two, um, depending on the person. And my sister was able to back me up with certain facts and give, you know, from an educator standpoint, you know, certain things. Um, I'm, I'm very, again, I'm very, very, very fortunate to have a supportive family. My dad at first was, was very, he didn't want to accept it. He didn't want to accept my son's diagnosis, especially not, you know, my younger son who was named after him. But as time rolled on and he saw the cousin who was a week older than Joey, way past to Joey with abilities, realized it was more than just it was it was just it was more it was something a lot more and when family came around and banded together and we kind of worked together for advocacy it was great but it also involved sending articles um my dad has a coworker who has a nephew who is profound autistic like Joey and my dad had open and honest conversations with them and had learned a lot and i think that that's where advocacy starts is open and honest conversations and not just with the maybe not just with your own family sometimes you don't want to hear your family especially with parents and grandparents they don't want to hear their kid know something that they don't know sometimes so hearing it from someone else outside of the family sometimes is better sometimes sending my parents an article all of those things were things that we did uh my family has done even my extended family aunts uncles cousins have done research on autism and if sent me emails and articles and said, hey, I saw this. I don't know if it's helpful. I don't mean to be difficult. And not everything is what works for our family, and that's okay. I always tell them, I appreciate you reaching out. We tried this or we didn't try this because, but I appreciate you reaching out. And I think that's advocacy is open openness. In addition to the autism diagnoses, there are some comorbid conditions that have led to the medical emergencies. Can you discuss those comorbid situations and how they have affected your family? Yes. Um, actually, we're just coming up on the one-year anniversary of my son's uh, seizure. 
my youngest son ha- has epilepsy, a diagnosis of epilepsy. He'll, they also, both of my boys have um, ADHD. I have ADHD myself. So that's probably where some of the openness in my family with neurodivergence comes from. Recognizing that we already have neurodivergence in the family is a little helpful. Uh, it was just just shy of a year ago. It was actually the 10th of June. I got a call that my son wasn't feeling well at school. I went to pick him up. He wasn't walking right. He, I went in his room. I, I put him in his bed to lay down. I went to get Pedialyte because he had vomited. I thought maybe he ate something because he was acting kind of weird. I was calling poison control, trying to figure out what he could have ate from my yard. And I went in his bed to check on him and he was just stiff. And this was like a matter of seconds from bringing him home. I don't even think it was five minutes. Um, and he was just laying there and he was just stiff. And his breathing was had changed. His eyes were open and I hung up with poison control, called 911. They came, they took him to the local hospital. The local hospital airlifted him to the closest children's hospital, um, which was in Rhode Island. From there, it was... I then spent my next few nights instead of sleeping researching autism and epilepsy again i have very supportive parents they were camping at the time and i told them joey is being intubated and airlifted to a children's hospital you know i i kind of need you guys and they packed their stuff up and got home as quick as they could they got right to the children's hospital where i was i called my parents were away my sister was teaching i called my aunt I need you to come get Remy. You know, I'm with Joey. This is going on. My aunt, I'll tell my boss my day's over. She came and helped with my older son. It was another layer of stress and fear, especially with my nonverbal child being epileptic now and him not being able to tell us like something's wrong. Um, It was a whole other level of anxiety and guilt and you know, I remember looking at that day and thinking, what did I do wrong? And they asked me questions in the hospital, like, are there drugs in the home? Well, of course not. Is there alcohol in the home? I'm normal. I have beer in my fridge, but my fridge is locked. And, it, you know, it's in it's in the canner. It's in a bottle with a bottle opener. He can't open that. It just all these questions and, you know, it just did I do something wrong? Did I leave a chemical out? Was this my fault? I can't I can't tell you how many times I ask myself that question. Even still, I have moments where I look around my yard like what plants are toxic? Like like what could have caused this? And the fact of the matter is they still don't know. He's doing very well on medication. I do want to say that. He hasn't had a seizure since then. But it did change and it made it scarier for my parents to care for him now because now there's medications involved in his care to prevent seizures and you know what do we do if and there was that fear on caregiver chronicles you talk about things like this because you recognize that a lot of us go around with this guilt with this exhaustion and you wanted people to know they weren't alone how has doing the podcast helped you it's helped me tremendously as it's opened avenues for me of not just not just letting go of the feeling of not being alone, not just letting go of the caregiver isolation. But also, I have learned so much from my guests. I'm fortunate to have amazing guests on every week. And they share their stories. And there's so many guests that I can relate to. Even if I'm not caring for somebody with that particular disease or illness or whatever whatever it is, because we have, we have people come on from all different caregiving aspects. And I don't care who you are. We're all one tragedy trauma diagnosis away from becoming a family caregiver or needing one ourselves and so it's kind of giving me an outlet that way it's connected me with resources it's connected me with families and it's just it's given me a sense of pride and it's giving me something to look forward to you mentioned that you've had people who care for family members with a variety of diagnoses some forms of neurodiversity happen later in life whether we like it or not alzheimer's dementia We are all, as you said, just a step away from something happening. How has hearing those stories opened your eyes? A lot because, well, again, I used to, I worked in long-term care for so long and it was very rare we'd see someone under 60 in long-term care. So my views on caregiving was mostly at senior citizens. It's mostly 
you know, the senior population. And that's not true. I've spoken with spousal caregivers who have had spouses in accidents. A lot of parent caregivers and a lot of parent caregivers for kids with, with different things. And it's just, it's reminded me that everybody is going through something pretty much. You know, the number of family caregivers out there, I think it's like 30% of the population identify as family caregivers. It's probably higher. It's it's probably a higher number. We just don't realize it when in and it can even be a temporary battle of of a family caregiver. Um, you can have a situation where, you know, your wife broke her arm and she can't go to the bathroom by herself temporarily because, you know, her arm's broken. And that can be exhausting on you as as a spouse trying to balance everything. Um, it could be a situation where, you know, maybe your significant other or your child has cancer, but it's curable, but they still have to go through the treatment and the pattern. So it can happen again. It can happen in an instant. And it's just it just really wakes you up to that. I'm thinking of our family right after the girls arrived in our lives. My wife was diagnosed with thyroid cancer and I had to fly solo for a little bit more than a week or two. When she's had to travel, I become the solo parent. We're we're pretty good at trading off because we've had to be. When she was getting treated for the thyroid cancer, that was difficult because you don't of the uncertainty. It, you want to shield your kids from that. I recently had a medical emergency. It was in ICU, and my wife brought the girls, and that was upsetting and traumatic for them. We are all just one or two steps away from that ICU visit or that cancer treatment or whatever, it's difficult to remember that you're not alone, that you're not the only person going through this. At the same time, I think it's it's tempting to try to dismiss your own experiences. Oh, well, other people have it more difficult. Other people have dealt with this. You shouldn't also diminish your, your stress and trauma. Just because someone else has been through having a spouse with cancer or being in the ICU doesn't mean you can't feel tired and that you shouldn't have some anxiety. But it is tempting to compare yourself and say, oh, well, other people have dealt with this. Why can't I? I'm nodding my head so much with that because I hate it when people say to me or when anybody, I don't care, when people say someone else has it worse. I know I know there's people that have it worse than me. I am well aware of this just just during the podcast, but just understanding the world in general. All it does is invalidate your situation as it's not the worst, so get over it. That doesn't help. That's not a supportive thing to say to a family caregiver. That's not a supportive thing for family caregivers to hear or even think themselves. They have enough shame. They have enough guilt. They have enough stress. It's so important to acknowledge what you're going through. Acknowledge what you're going through is difficult. When we take a moment and we say, yeah, this really bleeping sucks, you know, I hate this situation. It's okay. It's it's actually okay to feel that. So anger is a normal human emotion. We have to feel it sometimes. Like it's part of grief. It's part of life process. When we don't acknowledge it, it just builds and we explode. Or when we just kind of let it sit there and do nothing with it, it gets bigger. If we acknowledge it, yeah, I'm pissed off right now. You know, I'm I'm mad. I I'm frustrated. I don't like my situation. And then we do something to cope with it. Whatever it may be, whatever makes you feel better. Do something to cope with that anger, and then you can kind of move on and start to work on being proactive and things like that. But to just ignore it, to ignore your anger, to ignore your sorrow, to ignore your frustration, it only makes it worse. That temptation to compare your situation to other people and then to feel bad about yourself, it's it's so easy to give in to that. I see families with severely disabled children, and I feel like I'm I should be so lucky. You know, my family is fine. I oh my gosh, you know, why do I feel tired? But I do feel tired. Running two kids to all these therapy appointments and you know, back brace and OT, PT, speech therapy, whatever. I have a right to feel a little tired sometimes. And even though that makes me feel guilty, I need to remind myself that it's okay to be exhausted. You know, absolutely. And, I, you know, I have I have friends of neurotypical kids and they're tired too. 
especially during the pandemic. They were tired too. It's okay. And when my friend doesn't want to tell me about her day because because she knows my day was worse or she knows I have it harder, I tell my friends, like, listen, tell me about your day. Like, I don't care if you had a bad day. My my bad day, my, my worst day may have been worse than yours when in the grand scheme of things, but call me and vent anytime. I'm here. You know what I mean? Like, that's how I feel as a friend, as a person. Like, and who knows? Maybe, maybe the person you're venting to has some wisdom or something that they can share to help you get through it. Or even just to laugh. You know, sometimes you got to compare notes as parents and just laugh at your situation because there's nothing else you can do. When you started Caregiver Chronicles, you started recording even in the family truck. You started this really just on an impulse. Uh, Were you just at the point where you said, I have to do this? Yes, I was really, I, I well, initially I wanted to start a blog. However, my husband, Jeremy, was he works in media and he was working outside of the hall during that time too. And he was also burnt out. And he was like, I can't edit your writing. He's like, I love you. I love your speaking. He's like, your writing is horrible. He's like, it's it's definitely your weakness. He's like, what if we do a podcast instead? And um, we didn't really have fancy equipment. We're not, you know, we're not wealthy. We're not a wealthy family by any means. We never pretended to be. But we did. My friend came over and she hung out with my boys for a little bit. We went, sat in the truck on our phone and kind of poured our heart out. I started with a notebook writing down episodes um, of what I wanted to talk about. And then it got to a point where I started inviting people to come on the show and inviting guests. My first couple guests, I think, were friends. And then from there, we started finding other podcasts and other podcast hosts and recording with them. And it just it just turned into a thing bigger than I imagined it would ever be. And I'll include links to Caregiver Chronicles for Spotify and Apple Podcast in the show notes. The episodes you've done, though, have they have varied. You, as you said, you have had lots of different perspectives on. That's an interesting approach. So you're not just focused on caregiving for autism or caregiving for older parents. You're doing all caregiving. Yes. And I think it's important because, you know, as, as parents of autistic children, my parents are going to get old someday. They're either going to die. You, one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to die young or you're going to get old. There's kind of no in between. It's one or the other. And there's a good chance because they're both pretty healthy that they're going to get old and they're going to need a caregiver at some point in time. And I know with my experience, again, working in healthcare, helping care for my grandmother and with my kiddos that I'm probably going to be their primary caregiver. I have a sister. She's wonderful. She might handle the financial stuff. I might handle the physical stuff. I don't know. You know, whatever whatever mom and dad and us sit down, talk about, and plan. But I know I have in-laws who, who are older. Are they going to need help someday? How are we going to manage that? So many families have more than one medical condition in them or more than one thing going on. And multiple, that's what a family is, that everyone I think is going to be a caregiver. And I think focusing on the overlap and focusing on all these aspects of caregiving is so important because, again, caregivers get sick. You know, caregivers, caregiver support systems need support. And then that caregiver ends up being a caregiver for multiple people in the family. A lot of times the person who worked in healthcare ends up being the family caregiver. You said it's important to talk to your parents about these future plans. And a lot of us don't make plans. We don't think about our autistic children will get older. Our parents will get older. Our children with whatever special needs they might have or challenges they might have will get older. Our our spouses will get older. These are very difficult conversations to have. How will you care for your parents? How will you care for your youngest son who may or may not be able to integrate into the workforce and live independently? You know, that's a question that we think about a lot. Like you said, you have to have the conversation. You have to sit down. You have to have that conversation before it happens. I am hopeful. And again, I take it one day at a time in a sense, but, you know, always prepare for the future. My son is a 
Cub Scout, you know, we we be prepared. We prepare. And I know the conversations suck and they're hard to have. But we're kind of preparing ourselves right now for a world where our son, our youngest son lives and our older son, unfortunately, and I know that this is a huge burden, is going to have to take a very active role in caring for his younger brother. It, it might look like he's taking an active advocacy role if his younger brother is in a group home or long-term care, or it might be where he's doing all the care. I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like. I know who I have in mind is people who are going to help look after my son. I also know as far as my parents go, we've had blurbs of conversations about it. And I know my in-laws have as well and about, you know, who's going to do what and who's got the fullest plate versus who doesn't. Because those are all things that you got to consider too when you have these conversations. You know, if you have, if you have two able-bodied children and one of them has two children with special needs and they're always going to need care, it's kind of rude to ask that child to do all the things when you have another child that you can help. And, you know, but there's a lot of things that play into that family dynamics. Uh, we've covered a lot of this on Caregiver Chronicles as well. I think it's just important, like I said, I think if you don't have the conversations when things happen, you might not know what to do. And that's how caregiving can get messy in that sense. And you know that the eight-year-old will have more needs throughout his life. You're already taking that into consideration. Yes. Uh, that is something that we were kind of, we'd kind of been hinted towards uh, young in his age. And kind of, kind of a, in while the doctors don't want to say, well, we don't want to completely dismiss everything because who knows. It, it, there's also the conversation of, I don't see your son ever being able to do blank without support. Um, attend school without one-on-one -on -one support, shower himself without one-on-one -on -one support, go to the bathroom without one-on-one -on -one support, cook a meal. You know, knowing that and learning what resources are available in your community, the sooner, the better, because I know these resources, I can start getting information and resources and lists compiled. So that way there, when he transitions from school to adulthood for whatever that might look like for him, or whatever whatever comes after that, I know what my options are. I've talked to parents in my community. Make sure you find other parents of children like yours in your community, preferably ones who have been there. Because they're going to know exactly what resources. They're going to know who to call. In their nine times out of ten, they're going to be happy to tell you and help you. Because most people don't want to see their neighbors or someone else struggle. The networking has helped us because our youngest wasn't getting the support she needs, even with an IEP. That individualized education program just wasn't working for her at her public school. So we found a charter school that specializes in some of her needs. And that was suggested to us by other parents. You know, maybe it's time to look at a school that has those supports that's still a public school but a public charter knowing what other parents have been through helps a lot because quite honestly we can prepare ourselves and have those conversations with within our family we think you need a special school that has these things for you i don't know if it registers with her entirely but we're trying to prepare her now. You're going to go to a school. You're going to have a teacher who works with you one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to have a support professional. I don't know if it all, as I said, registers with her in quite the same way as it might our oldest, but those are discussions that because other families have been through this, we now know what to expect and we can prepare our children for those adventures. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, it, and that's, and that's, again, that's with all family caregiving and planning. And yeah, you know, some of the things that work for the other child or the other family isn't going to work for you. And that's that's okay. That's why you talk to as many families as you can. So you can get the ideas and you can take what you need from it. And the one or two pieces of advice or the couple pieces of advice that doesn't work for you, that's fine too. You mentioned seeking out resources. We were hesitant, and I think many families are hesitant to learn about what resources are available. 
our children now are qualified for the children's insurance program here in Texas. Finding supports, though, it can be embarrassing. It can be disheartening. It can You can feel like a failure because you need that extra help. How did you go about dealing with that, knowing that you're going to need some extra help? Because as you said, your child even had a medical emergency and those are expensive. Oh, yeah. Again, I was a very hard worker all my life and I always believed that anybody able-bodied who can work should. And we pay taxes in the United States for a reason. And part of our tax money goes to people who cannot work because of physical disability, mental disability, age, you know, things like that. I always was a firm believer in that. And I don't want to get like too political or anything like that. I don't I don't even think that that should be polarized or politicized to feel to feel like, hey, so, you know, if you're over 65 and you need help or, you know, you worked your whole life, here's help. Or if you were born with with a deformity or were in a tra- tragic accident. Yeah. You know, your country, your state, your government should help you. Um, we shouldn't just leave people to die because they can't physically work anymore. That's not that's not what a civilized society would do. So I always believed that. And I did have to leave my job. And when I left my job, we lost a third of our income. Again, this was this was in 2021 during inflation, like mass inflation. And uh, we weren't rich before. We, you know, I, I actually I'll give you numbers. We went from 65,000 to 40 ish thousand or just over 40,000 a year for income during inflation. We qualified for services in some services we didn't. There, there is shame. There is shame from people, but it's shame from people who have no clue what you're going through, what your life is like, and what your family needs. My kids need me home. I need to be home to support them. I get calls at least once or twice a week from the school nurse. Sometimes I have to leave home to go calm my son down or to go check him or to make sure, you know, whatever. Both of my kids, mind you, um, yesterday I had to go bring lunch to my kiddo because one of my my older kiddo because he forgot to pack it. I never know when I'm going to get a call. I never know when one of my kids is going to get sick. I can't just work when they're in school. Uh, even McDonald's wouldn't hire me for just, you know, when my kids were in school and give me the whole summer off to be home with them when they're home during the summer. That's, it's just not a thing. So you find ways to make flexible income which is something my husband and I have done. My husband's a very gifted writer and uh, has talents. We're fortunate enough that we did manage to get a sponsor for our podcast. I joined Caregiver Champions. There's there's different things that you can do to kind of get some flexible income. I do work one day a week. I work as a receptionist one day a week, Sunday afternoons. That's my me time. But as far as pi- applying for resources and the stigma about it, I don't care. I got to the point where I realized that I work for 17 years of my life, I worked in pay taxes as a nurse's aide. I needed to leave my job early to stay home with my kids. Lots. We don't shame moms for being stay-at-home moms of little ones. My kids' issues got more intense the older they got. Why would we shame me for needing to take time off now instead of then? In the payoff of me leaving my job, actually, my husband has gotten a lot healthier. He went from working third shift to first shift. He lost a lot of weight. He doesn't have high blood pressure anymore. He's not, you know, he had a fatty liver before. He doesn't have that anymore. So his health has improved. My mental health has improved. Yeah, we've had to get resources. It sucks, but it is what it is. That's that's just the way I see it is I don't really, I kind of let go of the, uh, I kind of let go of the shame and the stigma. And if someone has a problem with my family needing the resources, that's a them problem not a me problem, not a my family problem, because it just is this way. My wife is in management. She manages a technical communication team for an international engineering company. And during COVID, I stayed home. I did the homeschooling. I did not return to the workforce directly. I taught part-time online And now this coming school year, I'll be going back full time. But a lot of people were like, wait, you stayed home. You, your your wife worked and you ran all the, 
families have to adapt and COVID forced us to make a lot of changes and having special needs children forced us to make a lot of changes. One of us has to be able, as you said, to go to the doctor, to go to the school, to go to you know, the PT, the OT, what, whatever it is. Somebody has to do it. And the reality is my wife during this time has been the primary income earner. And by teaching online and getting some flexibility, I don't feel too bad that my kids joked about me, be, me being the mommy daddy. If if I'm mommy daddy to my girls, that's fine. Somebody had to do it. And if other people can't understand that, that's just, we, we chose, as you said, you have to make a choice. Your children are the money. And well, that was a really easy choice. That was a very easy choice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and the fact of the matter is, is with with any career and any job, you're you're like a thousand percent replaceable there. You know, I know they replaced me. I I know they did. I'm sure the person they replaced me with is just as wonderful as I was. At home, I'm not replaceable. If my mental health tanks and I'm not here anymore, or if something happens to me or my husband, that's it. You know, it's that's that's it. Like then what? And again, I think parents have to do what's best for their family. And that looks different for every family and every special needs family. And you're so right. As a teacher, a university could hire anybody to teach. There are plenty of PhDs out there who can teach anything I've ever taught. And I'm replaceable. But as as dad, no, I don't think that's an easily replaceable job. I dad is dad's my first job. And accepting the state insurance. That's something that if we hadn't done that, we'd we'd have gone backwards very quickly and drained all the savings and drained everything. You know, the oldest just got a new back brace and each back brace is $4,000. Not many families, I I know there are families who can just write the check, but not many families can just part with $4,000 every year for a back brace. We need that state insurance to help us out. Even if it's supplemental, we need it. At first, there was the, oh my gosh, we've got a state aid card for the girls. And then there's like, no, somebody has to care for them and provide for them. And as you said, they're going to become adults who will, well, one will certainly get a job and go to college. The other one may need some additional supports, but I can't feel guilty for guiding them and needing whatever resources I need to guide them successfully. Exactly. And it's not and it's not fair. And I I think the people who that like ingrained like I don't want help that like, you know, that like independence part of our brain or the I don't want to help others part of other people's brains. I think it's it's just there and it's because they haven't had to ask for it. They haven't had to need it. They haven't they don't know anybody that they're close to that really needs the help and the support. And it's just sad because they're I think 90% of the population in the United States is, again, one event away from one accident, injury, or illness away from becoming bankrupt and needing help. You know, not just needing a caregiver, but needing all the other stuff that goes with it. Most people don't live with, again, an extra $4,000 just chilling in their bank account or more, you know, and medical expenses add up really quick, really, really quick. It just, it just is. It's just the world we live in. Some people need help and support. And I think it's important to remember that when, you know, when you see a post, like I go on social media and I see posts on Facebook, like um, Amazon Prime has discounts for SNAP benefits. And people put angry a little emojis for that. And they're angry that there's a discount for people on SNAP benefits. Well, guess what? That person who's getting those food stamps you got to be really, really poor and you got to, you know, you, you don't, they don't just give those out to anybody. You got to be really poor. You got to meet the guidelines. And it's not even people trying to take advantage. It's actually, I think there's a good chunk of the military that receives SNAP benefits on um, military families. Uh, there's most SNAP benefits. There is at least one or two working household and then elderly and disabled people. So to give discounts for those types of benefits to me is totally fine. And if people have a problem with it, that's a them issue. They need to work on themselves and figure out why they're so angry that other people are getting help who need it. 
And caregiving, as you said, is a full-time job. And you're not always getting paid. You're not always getting state benefits for it. But you're caring full-time for someone who needs you to be there. And it is a job. And I think we we forget that parenting itself is a job. And then you add on any of the special needs, any of the challenges caused by disabilities, and it becomes a much more exhausting full-time job. Yeah, abs- absolutely. It, it Like 100%, yes. And again, unpaid, unpaid family caregivers. If uh, there was a recent study, it'd be billions of what we'd owe. Like if we actually paid family caregivers to be family caregivers, it'd be in the billions. By keeping our loved ones home and taking care of them at home, we're saving taxpayers billions of dollars. So if we need if we need food stamps or Medicaid or whatever, whatever service it is for our families that we're staying home and taking care of, if we need those, just we're still saving billions of dollars for this country by keeping our loved ones home. What's the future look like for your two boys? You're they're in public school? My youngest son is in public school. He is in an intensive learning program. So he gets a one-on-one and he's in a very small class that is catered to just students with disabilities. My older son is actually, he was outplaced from public school. They could not support his social and emotional needs. He is in a wonderful school that he's outplaced in, actually. Um, It was probably one of the best things that's ever happened to him. He is in a school now where he's got two other students in his class and he can kind of go on his own pace. He can, it's easier to make friends in that small group setting and they encourage his interests and hobbies as well as his education. The future for them, the future for my oldest one, I want to say the sky's the limit. He, his future looks very bright. He loves chess. I can tell you, I can tell you exactly what's going on this summer is a trip to the International Chess Hall of Fame in St. Louis and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio, which My younger son might not like the Chess Hall of Fame that much, so we're going to go to the zoo after. Um, But the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, we're all going to love that because music's our thing. But as far as the future goes, I think think it just is a matter of taking it one day at a time, doing what's best for us, and trying to live happy lives. I want to thank Sarah Stelmach-Brown, host of the Caregiver Chronicles podcast, for joining us on Perspectives on Neurodiversity. Again, if you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to like it and subscribe, share it on social media. Don't forget to read the Autistic Me blog and follow our posts on social media. I am Christopher Scott White speaking as the Autistic Me. Sarah, it has been wonderful having you on the podcast. Thank you so much again for having me. And thank you for your work on the Caregiver Chronicles. Thank you.